Good evening, good evening, good, good evening. Welcome to the Second Mile Zion Wednesday night words of encouragement. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Angela Davis, um, and I will be starting out, I will be teaching our lesson for tonight. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for how great and for how wonderful you are. We thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to stand here before your people, Father God, and to give them your word, Father God. I ask, Lord, that you would just have your way, Father God, that you would get the glory and that you would get the honor, Father God, that the hearts would be softened and that the mind will be open, Father God, and that the people will receive your word, Father God. I ask, Father God, that you allow for change to take place, Father God, and that when it's all said and done, Father God, that we will strive every single day to be more and more like you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Okay. Amen. Okay. Our focus for tonight is be Jesus's best representative. As we go through the lesson this evening, we will look at our role as Jesus's representative, Jesus's ministry, the power of our mouth, and our words, and evangelism. Whenever we go to court, it's important that we have the best representation possible. This person is speaking on our behalf. What they say and how they plead our case, it matters. It makes a difference. We don't want or we don't choose people who are not qualified to handle our case. We don't pick people who will not give it their all. And we also don't pick people that don't care, that don't have our backs, and who don't believe in us. And we're talking about representation tonight. The first scripture that we'll look at tonight says we are Jesus's ambassadors. Let me read the description for ambassador. And ambassadors are the highest ranking diplomatic officials sent by governments to countries or international organizations. As ambassadors, they present the thoughts, the ideas, and the terms of the ones who sent them. Ambassadors understand that it's not about their ideas or their agenda. I've come to realize that the Lord uses different people to get his point across. For me, it's always about a lot of scriptures and a lot of questions. As I was preparing for the lesson tonight, I had a lot of questions come up and I'm gonna share them with you guys. The lesson, the questions helped me to evaluate myself. And when I evaluate myself, especially when you're dealing with personal change, scriptures that deal with changing our attitudes, changing the way that we talk, changing the way that we walk, changing the way that we treat people, it always causes me to get questions. And when I get these questions, what I do is I do some self-evaluation. And I see, does the way that I'm living and do my actions, do they line up with what God's word says? And if they don't, sometimes it's a struggle, but a lot of times I try to make the change in order that God might be pleased and that God might be happy, because then life is a lot easier. My hope is that you will think about these questions and do some self-evaluation of your own. And where necessary, make the much needed changes or adaptations to your life. The first set of questions I have in reference to us being the best representative for Jesus is, are you being the best possible representative for Jesus? Can people tell that you're behave by your behavior and your speech that you are God's child? Do you look like him? Do you exhibit the ways and the attitudes and the behavior of Jesus? Is your behavior and your speech attractive to others? Do people want to know more about Jesus based on how they see you and based on how you speak to them? I want to give a big shout out to the tech team because I always, like I said, have a lot of scriptures and they always never give me a hard time and just make sure everything runs smoothly. So the first thing we're gonna talk about going forward is our role as Jesus's representative. The first scripture we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at 2 Corinthians chapter five, verses 17 to 21. And it reads, what this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore. 
for the old life is gone, a new life has begun. All the newness of life is from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ did, and God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors. We speak on God's behalf. And God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as though Christ himself were here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. And in another scripture it says, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The scripture says, it starts, off, it starts off differently, but it says, as we go on, it says that we are Christ's ambassadors. We have been given the message of reconciliation to pass on to other people. The message of reconciliation is basically spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is through this message that we all take part. That means that all of us have a part to take in passing on the message of Jesus Christ to one another. In this process of reconciling people back to God, God is making his appeal through us. He uses us. We are his mouthpiece. When we plead to people, when we say to them, come back to God. All of this is in us being Jesus's representative. God has entrusted us with the responsibility of telling people, especially the lost and those who are unsaved and those who do not believe about Jesus. We are to introduce him to the people. We are to let them know that he is the one who died, he is the one who rose, he is the one who saved us. And we are also to let them know that through Jesus Christ we receive the promise of eternal life. With so much going on in the world, there's so many people dying every day, people are getting killed on a daily basis, we gotta get serious about introducing people to Christ. All of us who are professing Christians, all of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we are his ambassadors. We are his mouthpiece, we are his spokespersons, we are his representation here on the earth. In order to be the best representative, what do we need? Well, first of all, our lifestyles, our attitudes, our words, our values, they need to line up with, with Jesus. They need to line up with what Jesus is doing. We must understand, we must know, and we must believe in what Jesus believes. So what did Jesus believe? What was Jesus about? What was Jesus' mission? I'm glad you asked. So what was Jesus about? When we look at Luke 2, and I didn't give this to the tech team, but when we look at Luke 2, 49, it says, this is Jesus speaking to his parents when they went, he was around 13 years old when he was in the temple teaching after they thought he got lost. He said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So that's what Jesus was about. Jesus was about his father's business. Not only did Jesus do miracles like turning water into wine, giving sight to the blind, healing those who were lame and those who were mute, and raising people from the dead, he also did public ministry, teaching and revealing to the people the reason for why he came. Jesus came to earth to save the people, to save those who were lost, and to set them free. He came to reconcile mankind with God. He came to bridge the gap. He came to make things right with God. When he died on Calvary, he made sure that he paid the price for us. The price was, the, the penalty was death. But when Jesus went to Calvary and died in our place, he took over and he paid the price. So now man and God can be reconciled, can be put back together. The relationship could be fixed. Let's look at Luke 4, verses 14 through 21. When we look at this scripture, we're going to see that Jesus is announcing his ministry, which is an Old Testament prophecy fulfillment that's found in 
Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Okay, it starts with Luke number 4, starting at verse number 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Soon he became well known throughout the surrounding country. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. Nazareth was Jesus' hometown. It was where he grew up at. And it was his custom to go to the synagogue. Hold up, Kelly. It was his custom to go to the synagogue. And when he, when he went to the synagogue, he did what he normally did. And what he normally did is he taught the people and he talked to the people and he told them what his purpose was. He talked about God, he talked about his kingdom, and he talked about his purpose. Okay, Kelly, we can go to the next one. The scroll containing the message of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him, and he unrolled the scroll to the place where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. The poor are those people who know and who realize and who understand that they, can do any, that they can't do anything without Jesus, that they need Jesus, that they need salvation. He has sent me to proclaim the captives to be released. Those who are captives in their minds and even those who are captive by the law. The law was made and the law was given so that we can realize and recognize how bad we were. The law's purpose was to lead us to Jesus Christ. And there's no way, and I'm, the law I'm talking about is the Ten Commandments, and there's no way that we can keep the Ten Commandments. If we mess up one commandment, we've messed up the whole commandment. So those who are captive by the law think that if I do these good things, if I keep these commandments, then I can be saved. No, salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. And that's what Christ is saying here. He's saying that I am the one, I am the way. The purpose that I came was to save mankind and to bring you back with God. So Jesus came to proclaim captives will be released, that they will be released from the captivity in their mind, their way that they think, and be released from the captivity of the law. That the blind will see. Those people who are in darkness, those people who, don't, who can't see and don't understand the truth about God, that's why Jesus came, so that they can be able to have sight and understand and know what the truth is that the downtrodden will be free from the oppressors, those things that hold you down, those things in life that hold you down, and even if people will hold you down. Jesus came so that we can be free from the oppressors. The next one, Kelly. Thank you. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. Everyone in the synagogue stared at him intently. Then he said, the scripture has come true today before your very eyes. So this here is Jesus presenting to the people. He says, this is my mission. This is my ministry. This is the reason why I came. And I said in the beginning that this scripture is also found in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and verse number 2. And what it is, is, is a prophecy fulfillment about Jesus. And when you look at Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2 in the NIV, this is what it says. Give me. Yes, Isaiah 61. Thank you, Kelly. I know I didn't give you this. Verses 1 and 2. Okay, it's okay, I can read it from here. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Let me get the NIV version, I'm sorry. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness and to release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. When we look at this and when we look at Luke, they pretty much say the same thing. But when Jesus 
we cited the first, he read, I'm sorry, he read from the scroll that was given to him, the first verse. Exactly. And, but then when he got to the second verse, he only read the part A part. The part A part says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He did not go on to read the second part that says, and the day of vengeance of our God. And the reason why he stopped there was because Jesus wanted the people to understand that now is the time for salvation. Now is the time for people to be saved. From the time that Jesus starts from the time Jesus started his preaching until he comes back for those of us who belong to him, now is the time to, for us to receive salvation. Now is the time for us to tell people, come to Jesus, be a part of his family, accept him as your Lord and Savior. Not only that, vengeance is going to come, but vengeance will not come until the church has been raptured. And this is prophesied in the book of Revelation when Jesus comes back with his two-edged sword. All of this we're talking about is Jesus' mission. What is Jesus about? Because as his representative, we can't properly represent him if we don't know what we're talking about, if we don't know who he is, if we don't know how to go out and how to speak for him and to speak about him. Okay. Jesus came for the lost, for the hopeless, for the captives, for the brokenhearted, for the blind, for the oppressed, for the downtrodden. Jesus came for anybody who needed salvation. All right, we read that, we went over that part already. When we look at Matthew 9, verses 35 to 10-1, we see that Jesus' ministry was characterized by a driving passion for people for sinners, for those who don't know. Matthew 9, starting at verse number 35. Jesus traveled, I'm sorry, Jesus traveled through all the cities and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogue and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And wherever he went, he healed people of every sort of disease and illness. He felt great pity for the crowds that came because their problems were so great and they didn't know where to go for help. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He said to the disciples, the harvest is so great, but the workers are so few. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. We just said that Jesus was driven by compassion. His compassion was for the people, the people who were lost, the people who didn't know their way. That's who Jesus was driven for. Who are we driven for? Are we driven for those people that we like? Are we driven for those people that's going to listen to us? Are we driven for those people who can make a change in our life? Do we care about those people who don't know? Do we care about those people who don't want to hear what we have to say? Do we say, okay, you don't want to hear it, I'm not going to tell you anymore? That's not what Jesus did. Jesus kept on going. We got to keep on going. We got to keep on sharing the word. We got to keep on telling people about Jesus, even if they don't want to hear it. When we were young, we didn't want to hear the stuff that our parents told us. But over time, they kept saying the same thing to us over and over and over again. And guess what? It stuck. And as we got older, now we start talking like them. Now we start acting like them. Now we just start doing the same things that they did. And we like, what the world is going on? It's because of what they said has stuck and has stayed with us. Okay? So we can't stop. We got to stay. We got to keep pressing. Jesus' compassion was active, even unto death. We see that those he taught to pray, he also sent them out with a task. It says that he told them that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And he also gave them the authority to heal the sick. So Jesus, they were the ones who prayed. They were a part of that answer prayer because Jesus said to them, you go out, you go out to the harvest, you go and gather the people, you go and tell them what they needed to know. That's the same thing that he tells us today that we need to go, that we need to continue to talk and to tell people about him. Now we're gonna look at the power of our words. So we talked about us being the best representative for Jesus, okay? So as us being the best representative for Jesus, my next set of questions are, what are we saying to people? What is coming out of our mouths? 
Many times the unbelievers and the unsaved, they will judge Jesus based off of us, how we act and the things that we say. Are we being like Jesus? For Jesus was compassionate, Jesus was kind, Jesus was loving. It showed not only in his actions, but it also showed in his word, the way he spoke to people. Let us not forget that our words have power. Let's see what Proverbs 21, 18 says. <clears throat> Proverbs 21, 18 says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So this says that the greatest good and the greatest harm are in the power of the tongue. When we get to James, which we're gonna look at shortly, James tells us some things about the tongue. Let's see what he tells us first and then we can read it. James tells us that the tongue is a small, dangerous muscle with a lot of power. It can control one whole person and influence everything in our lives. It can do some damage as well. Like a fire, the tongue's sinful words can spread destruction rapidly. It can also permeate and ruin everything around it. He says that the tongue is deadly. It defiles, it pollutes, and it contaminates. Not only that, but both blessings and curses come from the tongue. We come to church, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, I love you, Lord, you're the world to me. We leave out, we get in an argument with people, we get mad at people, we hold grudges, we talk about people. These are the same things that come out of the same mouth, the same tongue. So this tongue is dangerous, it's dangerous. Not only that, he tells us that no man can control the tongue. It is controlled only by the power of God. All right, so let's look at it. So in case you think I'm lying, let's look at it for ourselves. James 3, verses 5 through 12. It says, likewise, the tongue is a small part, a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Wow. Uh, yes, full of deadly poison. Wow. Okay. So, uh, we did that. When I was young, I remember growing up, and when we were young, we used to, like, sometimes people would tease you, or people would talk about you, or back in the day, we used to call it bussing. People would bust on you. That means that they would say, like, tell jokes, like, your mom's so fat, you know, she eat a whole bucket of chicken, you know, something like that, you know? And so, you know, you know, we will be, this, this is, you know, some, sometimes with your friends, that was good, but for those people who weren't your friends and they talked about you, a lot of times we had a phrase that went, sticks and stones may hurt, may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's a lie. That's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. Because words do hurt. Not only do words hurt, but words can change our actions and words can change our thoughts. I know my mom didn't mean anything about it, but I remember when I was young. I was a tomboy, I liked to play outside, I used to play hard, run and everything. And I remember one day coming home with my friends and she was like, oh, you need to go upstairs and wash your underarms, they stink. I was so embarrassed and I was so hurt. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she said that in front of everybody. I went upstairs and I did it, but to this day, I am so self-conscious of me. I make sure in the morning time that everything is good and through the course of the day, I make sure that I stay on top of it. She didn't, those words she said weren't to hurt me, they were to help me. So sometimes it could be negative, the outcome, or it could be positive. For me in this instance, it was something positive because I didn't have to hear anybody else say that to me because I made sure I stayed on top of it for myself. <laughs> That's why it's so important 
That's why it's so important in being Jesus' representative that we have to be aware, that we have to be mindful of the way that we treat people and the way that we speak to people, the things that we say to them and also how we say things to them. Jesus says these words in John 13, verses 34 to 35. He says, with, thank you, Cal. John 13, verses 34 through 35. And we're still talking about what we, to, and we're still talking about how we treat people, what we say to them. John 13, verses 34 and 35. This is what Jesus says. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's how people know that we believe, that we belong to Jesus, by the love that we show them the love in our actions, the love in our speech. No, we don't have to let people walk all over top of us, but we still, we can still get respect, but we can still be respectful at the same time. If you're not sure what love looks like, let's jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses four to eight, and then we're gonna drop down to 13. I told y'all I always have a lot of scriptures. It says, this is, now this is talking about love, what love is. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Jumping down to 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So for order for us to be a good representative of Christ, we need to know what love is, we need to know what Jesus' purpose is, and that's what we need to portray in our everyday life. So again, I ask you, what is coming out of your mouth? What are you saying to people? Are you speaking words of negativity, confusion, envy, lies, slander, death, and complaints? Are you using words that are rude, that are offensive, that tear down, that belittle, that shame and hurt? Or are you speaking life, hope, love, positivity, and healing? Using words that build up, that encourage, that edify, and that uplift one another. Through our actions and with our speech, we, I'm sorry, through our actions and with our speech, are we turning people off and turning people away from Christ? Or are we leading people to Jesus by evangelizing, sharing the gospel, and telling them of our own personal experiences and stories about how great God and Jesus has been to us? That's just some thought, and all of these things are hypothetical questions for you to think about, for when you get home, to think about, to evaluate your own life. Are you being a, the best representative for Jesus that you can be, or do you need some help? If you need some help, the, pur the whole purpose of this lesson is for you to see where you are, and if you need to make changes, then make them, because guess what? It's not too late. It's not too late. We can always start again. If Jesus, the Lord, woke us up this morning, that means that he has given us new grace and new mercies. That means that he still has something for us to do. So it's not too late. If you messed up yesterday, if you messed up just a few minutes ago, go to the Lord, ask for forgiveness, get back up, and start all over again. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to talk about evangelism. This is a big thing. So all, this, all these things that we have been talking about now have led us up to this here. We talked about being the best representative for Jesus. We talked about what is our role 
as a representative for Jesus. Our role is that we are to take, we, it says that we have been given the message of reconciliation, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we are supposed to go and to give it to people, to tell people about it. Okay, so basically that in a nutshell is evangelism. So Jesus says that we are to go out into the world and we are to tell people about him, about how great he is, that they can also be a part, that they can receive everlasting life, that he has died for them, that he loves them. Jesus loves you. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter how bad you think that you are. He loves you. There's nothing you can do about it and nothing can separate you from his love. So wherever you are, whatever is going on, don't think that you can't come back. Don't think that you can't come to him. Don't think he don't want me because he do. He's there. He's waiting for you. And he says, come back. His arms are open and he's waiting for you to just come. Amen. Okay. In our women's discipleship class, we're studying a book and it's called Spiritual Discipline for the Christian Life. And the author is Donald S. Whitney. Recently, we've just finished the chapter on evangelism. I'll be fitting for what we're talking about tonight. As I listened to Pastor on Sunday, one of the many things that he said stood out to me in, relations, in relation to evangelism. He said, the last commandment Jesus left for the disciples and for us is the least command that concerns us. Again, he said, the last commandment that Jesus left for the disciples and for us is, is the least command that concerns us. And that commandment was evangelism. We're going to look at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As Jesus' representative, we are given the responsibility of evangelism. Evangelism, telling people the good news about Jesus. We see that in Matthew 28, Jesus, the one with all power, Jesus, the one who sacrificed and laid his life down for ours, Jesus, the one who went to Calvary, who hung, who bled, and who died all on his own terms, Jesus, the one who raised God from the dead, the one who God raised from the dead, he says to us, we are to go out into the world. We are to tell the people all that we know about him, all that we have learned about him, and we are to baptize them, and that we are to know, he says for us to know that he will always be with us. When we look at Acts 1.8, we see that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the power needed to be Jesus' witness. Let's look at Acts 1.8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Again, I say, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the power to be Jesus's witness. We already got it on the inside of us. We don't got to work at it. We got to know what the scripture says. We got to know what the, who the Lord is. We have to be in line with his ways and his thoughts and everything like that. But we already got the power on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit is already there. We already got it. All right. I'm trying not to go too ahead of myself. When I thought about all this, I said, Jesus believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. I say this because he has given us, the people who mess up every day, the people who sin every day, the people who talk about people, the people who, the peop us, us people that's all messed up. He believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. 
He gives us the responsibility. He gives us the job. What job do we have? We have the job to speak about him, and we also have the job to speak for him. We talked about a representation. When we go to court, we want somebody who is qualified for the job. Are you qualified for the job? We want somebody who cares about us winning the case. Do you care about winning souls for Christ? We want somebody who's not, who's going to give it their all. Are you willing to give everything for Jesus Christ? Because he gave everything for us. Hmm. So I ask you, I say to you, are we going to tell those people who don't know the unbelieving and the unsaved and those who are lost who Jesus is? Jesus knows the power of the Holy Spirit. He knows that the Holy Spirit will empower us with the needed strength as well as with the blessed and powerful word of God and that we will be able to accomplish that which we have been commissioned to do. Our problem is that we rely too much on self. We think for some crazy reason we can do it without him. When the reality is we can't pull it off, we can't do anything without him. We can't walk, we can't talk, we can't breathe, we can't do anything without him. We need him for everything. I don't care how successful you are, you ain't make it that far by yourself. You made it because the Lord worked it out for you that way. It was God's grace, mercy, and favor that was on you. And for those of us who feel like we haven't made it, God, God is still blessing us. Every single day we wake up in the morning time, we have new grace, we have new mercy. God does something good for each and every person every single day. So when we talk to people, we should have something new to say to them because God is always doing. God is always looking out. God is always blessing. God is always taking care of us. So we should have something new when we talk to people. Don't tell me, I don't know what to say. I don't have nothing to say. What Jesus do for me? What the heck did he do for you? Think about that. All right, so we said that we rely too much on ourselves. What we need to do is, we need to start believing in the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. We need to believe that he will work through us and what, what is it that we have to do? We have to submit to him. We have to rely on him. We have to trust. We have to follow. And we have to depend on him. Those are the things that we have to do. We have to put our trust in the Holy Spirit and take our trust out of ourselves. We need to deny ourselves daily and do what, listen to the Holy Spirit and follow where he leads us. He will not lead us astray. He will not lead us down a wrong road. He will make sure that everything goes well. He will lead us in the right, in the right direction. God has not asked us to do anything he hasn't already equipped us to do. He has already given us the power of the Holy Spirit to witness, and he has already given us a powerful message to share. The gospel we share is embedded with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Romans 1, verses 16 through 17. Romans 1, 16 through 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone, who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And what I just said to you was, I said the gospel is embedded with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why people can be converted, whether they hear it from an elderly person, from a middle-aged person, from a teenager, from a child, whether they hear it from a pastor or an elder of a church, or even from a lay person like myself. If they hear it at church, if they hear it in the street, if they hear it in the car, if they read it from the Bible, even if they read it from the track, the power of the word is what saves. Not me, not you, not pastor. We are the mouthpieces. We are the vessels. It's the power of the word that saves. So when we, it's the power of the word that saves. I got, I, I got, to, I got to stay on track, okay. In the book, in the book, Whitney, Whitney that's, that's the author's name, Donald Whitney, he talks about evangelophobia. 
What is evangelophobia? It's the fear that Christians have when it comes time to witness for Christ. I like to call them Christian excuses. I call them excuses because we have no need to be fearful if we really think about it. Why? Because first of all, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us and he gives us the power to evangelize. Secondly, the gospel that we're sharing is blessed by God and has the power needed to convict, to convince, and to convert. So God has already given us all of the tools that we need. We just got to know what it says, believe in it, open our mouth, and say it, and God will do the work. I'm sure we can relate with one, if not all five of these phobias, um, these phobias of evangelism. Even if we've grown past being fearful of evangelizing, and for those who and for those who evangelize freely, I'm sure that at one point or another you could relate with one of these. So the first phobia is the need for extensive or specialized training in order to witness effectively. These individuals fear speaking to others based on the idea that they don't know enough about what the Bible has to say. These people fear that they are not equipped enough to answer any possible questions that may arise. And a lot, I remember back, I remember a long, long, long time ago, here at Second Mount Zion, we used to have a class, and they used to teach us about witnessing, going out into the street and witnesses, and we used to go down, I think it was called the Romans Road, so we was in Romans, and we would go from one scripture in Romans to the next, to the next, to the next. All right, so these people are fearful. What are they fearful of? They're fearful that they don't know enough, and they're fearful that they are not equipped to answer the questions. The second phobia is a fear of being labeled as strange or even being rejected because of you believing in Christ. The third phobia is talking to strangers about Jesus. That's more of a going door to door type of evangelism. This type of fear can cause can also be felt when we talk to our family, our friend, to our family or our friends who don't have the same type of beliefs that we have. Here at Second Mount Zion, we focus on relational evangelism. That's when we build relationships with one another. We build relationships with those people in our circles of influence, meaning people in our jobs, people in our households, people in on our neighborhood, people, our classmates. Those people we build relationships with, and as we build relationships with them, we can start to talk to them and conversate with them and to let them know who Christ is. The fourth phobia is the seriousness, the seriousness of evangelism. These individuals feel that a person's eternal destiny is before them. They fear, they fear becoming a stumbling block for the person's salvation. Even though they know that salvation is God's territory, these individuals still feel a sense of responsibility and dread when they have to communicate the message of Jesus Christ faithfully. The fifth phobia, and the last phobia, the sharing experience itself. These individuals aren't able to explain their belief and their theology to anybody. And when, they, and when they are done sharing, they do share, but when they are done sharing, they second guess or doubt the things that they have said. These people leave feeling worse. They feel like they are inadequate, they feel like they are unsure, and they feel like they are failures. All of these fears that we talked about stem from the lack of confidence in self as well as in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I have to admit, I'm in, I before, I felt some of these ways that I've read about in these phobias, feeling like I didn't know enough about what the word said. But thank God that you gotta keep on. If you feel like you don't know what's going on, if you feel like you don't have an understanding, if you feel like you have these fears, what you need to do is you need to read the word. You need to read the word, you need to study the word, you need to meditate on the word. You need to come to church on Sunday mornings. You need to come to Bible study, you need to come to Sunday school. You need to put yourself in a place where you can learn more about the word and you need to build up your relationship that you have with Jesus Christ so that you can be the best representative for him that you can be, so that when you 
have to talk to people you feel like you are equipped, when you have to talk to people you can tell them what you believe in, it's easy. All we gotta do is talk about Jesus. I'm sure you know who Jesus is and what he did. Some, that's all you gotta do is tell him because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, then I will draw all men unto me. That's what he said. So the, the task is simple, the task is easy. Are we gonna do it? Are we gonna get better? And then doing all of this, like I said, the Lord had me go through all of these questions so I could evaluate myself and make the changes where they're needed. I'm not perfect. I got to make the changes as well. Okay, so we, what we have to do is also we have to stop putting so much pressure on ourselves. Remember that we are the mouthpieces that speak the truth about God and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word says, some plant some water, but God is the one who gets the increase. The remedy is to know more, more, and more about Jesus. Read, study, and meditate on the scriptures. Trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and face that fear head on. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. So we talked about all of these prayers and all this other stuff, but Whitney, the author of the book, he didn't stop there. He goes on to talk about successful evangelism. Successful evangelism is simply sharing the gospel of Jesus, sharing the good news of Jesus, and sharing our personal testimonies, whether people come to Christ or not, is successful. All you gotta do is tell people about Jesus. It might not be their time, God knows. You don't have to get all of the accolades and say, oh, thank you so-and-so, this one said this to me, so now I was able to come to church. No, just tell them about Jesus and let God do what God do. Let's think about pastor for a moment. Many Sundays, pastor stands up here and he preaches a good sermon. He tells the people about Jesus Christ and he tells them the good news about Jesus Christ. And a lot of times, people don't walk down the aisle, people don't come and get saved. Does that mean that his testimony was not successful? Hmm. Of course not, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that it was not successful. Whenever we share the gospel, whenever we tell someone about Jesus, we have succeeded, okay? So whenever we share the gospel, whenever we tell someone about Jesus, we have succeeded. All biblical evangelism is successful evangelism, regardless of the outcome. It's just like when we go to a good party or, or a nice show or in an event or the movies or a restaurant. When we come back, we tell our friends and our family how good of a time we have. We share these things with them. We tell them all about it. We want them to engage in our experience. It really doesn't matter if they don't get the experience those things for themselves, that doesn't stop us from telling them how good of a time that we had. What we want for them to do is know that, hey, we went here, we had such a good time, we want them to enjoy the experience with us. That's how excited and forthcoming we should be about sharing Jesus with other people. It doesn't matter. Of course we want them to join. Of course we want them to be hooked up with Jesus. Of course we want them to become a part of the family. Of course we want them to have everlasting life. But we can't let the fact that people may not come keep us, keep us quiet, keep us from telling them about Jesus Christ. We gotta continue to speak. We gotta continue to share the word to everybody. And we can't be judgmental. We can't say, oh, I don't like this person. Oh, that person don't look like me. Oh, that person was mean to me. It doesn't matter. Everybody needs Jesus. Rich, poor, white, black, male, female, Everybody, everybody needs Jesus, so we got to tell everybody about Jesus. The power, I can't say it enough, the power for people to be made right comes through the message of Jesus. It's not us, it's the message. If we give that message, we can be assured that some will come, that some will receive Christ. Our part in evangelism, I said it early, is really simple, it's really easy. All we have to do is just talk about Jesus. He said again, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. For the word of God has the power to save, 
The word of God has the power to save. The word goes forth and does what it's supposed to do, and it does not come back void. For this reason, we can be confident that the saint, we can be confident that some will believe if we will be faithfully and tenaciously share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all I have for you tonight. I hope that you didn't, if you didn't get anything else from this lesson, I hope that you got that evangelism is easy. In order for us to be the best rep for Jesus Christ, we need to know who he is. And he, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to tell people about Jesus. And when we speak about him, the word itself has the power to save. I pray that everyone will have a good night. And thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. And thank you, Pastor Moore. Simpson now will close us out. Amen. We certainly thank Sister Angie for that lesson. Amen. Amen. And for, and for do, those of you who are online, if you don't hear the applause, we might bring Sister Angie back every week because yeah. this is about the biggest crowd we done had in I don't know how long since the pandemic. God bless you, Sister Angie. Be a representative for Jesus. And I just want to echo what Angie says, because I think a lot of times we make Christianity harder than what it is. And I remember I heard a quote, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton said this quote that is attributed to Francis of Assisi, and it goes, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Which means that all of us can preach the gospel with just how we live. Evangelism, you know, we don't have to be the ones waving, waving people down. Just your lifestyle can speak volumes to people and draw people in. So if you're not the, you know, if you if you're not from the school of Billy Graham, or Joyce Myers, to go out there and, and wave people down and talk so eloquently, talk with your lifestyle, and I guarantee you, somebody gonna say. What you doing? And that's when your invitation is to bring them. And all you got to do is say, well, we open from, you can come to Second Mount Zion at 9 a.m. You can come at Wednesday at 7. And soon as the block get open, you can come at noontime. I think we almost there. Amen. Amen. So we certainly thank Sister Angie for that. Uh, we want to keep in prayer uh, Pastor Moore as he's retreated to his uh I guess his country home or his 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 silent place. Yeah, you, you got it, Basil. That's right. I ain't gonna say too much. But uh we just want to pray for him as he travels and for all those who are on our sick list, we want to continue to pray for them as well. Um bow with me for a moment of prayer as we close out. Lord, we thank you now for this opportunity. We thank you now for the word that you have given us. We thank you for Sister Angie, who has certainly studied and showed herself approved tonight. We pray now, Lord, that these words, these scriptures will sink in, Lord, that they will be meat for our souls, O oh Lord, that, Father God, we would use these to seek to live thereby. And as we go out into this world, which seems cruel and unusual, Lord, that, Father God, you would guide us by your word, O oh Lord, that you would protect us, O oh Lord, protect our families, O oh Lord. Let us be the light that people see. Let us be the Jesus that people see in their communities, even in this time of despair, O oh Lord. Recharge us now, O oh Lord. Charge us up for the job. Charge us up for this walk that you have us on, O oh Lord. Father God, we thank you and we praise your name. Until we come back together, we just continue to bless you. We lift up our pastor now, Lord. We pray that you would be with him and that you would recharge him, give him a word that when he comes back, O oh Lord, that Father God, he can reach the people, O oh Lord. So Father God, we thank you, O oh Lord. And now as we continue and we prepare to depart from this place, but ever not your presence, we ask your traveling blessings upon those who are here with us and those who are online. We bless you and we ask, we speak blessings to you as well. We thank you, O Lord. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We say go in peace and serve the Lord and see you Sunday. God bless.